Hello my friends, my name is Mark David Welsh, author and publisher, and this is my reading roundup for December 2019. But before I begin, slight disclaimer, this is the first YouTube video I've ever filmed, so I apologise if the content's not as professional as you're used to, and if I break any of the unwritten rules of YouTube, because I have no idea what they are, and I have no idea what I'm doing. But enough prevarication, to the books! Now this year I've decided to take part in a classics readathon curated by Lucy the Reader, who's one of my favourite booktubers. And I'll put a link to her channel in the description below if I can figure out how to do that. Now, I'm no stranger to classics. Most mornings when I wake up, it feels like I've been around for as long as some of these books. So it's a natural fit for me. And I've read all the fiction by Arthur Conan Doyle, by Bram Stoker, by Mary Shelley, by Edgar Allan Poe, Herman Melville. I've also read most of Dickens and all but one of Dostoevsky's novels, as well as one-off Gothic novels such as The Castle of Otranto, uh, The Mysteries of Adolfo, which was a book I found to be incredibly infuriating, hilarious and boring all at the same time. Now the challenge of this readathon is to read at least one classic per month, which seems well within my capabilities and habits. So I thought I'd get a head start in December, and I chose a book called The Vampire by John Polidori, which was written in 1819. At least I think it's called The Vampire as opposed to The Vampire because the title is spelt with a Y. And I think it sounds more exotic anyway, so I'm going with that. Now this story has quite a reputation. Basically it's thought to be the first ever to present the vampire as a handsome, tragic, romantic figure in literature. And the story has a famous origin too, because Polidori was not a writer by profession at all, but a doctor. And he was actually the personal physician of the poet Percy Shelley. Now, Polidori was wintering at Lake Geneva one year with Shelley and Shelley's lover Mary Wollstonecraft. And one night, during a wild storm, after dinner they decided to have a ghostwriting contest. And of course, this was the famous occasion when Mary Shelley, to be, came up with the idea for Frankenstein. Now, according to her, Polidori's story was about a skull-headed woman who looked through keyholes and was apparently hopeless. But other sources seem to suggest this was when he got the idea for the vampire. So whatever the truth of that and how much revision may have gone on over the years as to the story's actual genesis, it still seemed like a really good place to start for someone with gothic taste like myself. So I ordered a copy and then this arrived, which looks fine at first until you realise that it's a short story of barely 20 pages, which was really not what I expected. So what's it like? Well, considering it's such a brief story, events take place over a period of more than a year and take the protagonist from the drawing rooms of London to the cities of Italy to the forests of Greece. So, as you might have gathered, we don't really get to know the characters in any depth. We don't really get to review the events in any depth either. In fact, it's more like an outline for a novel than an actual story in its own right. So, whereas it obviously has extreme historical importance as a reading experience, I found it to be extremely disappointing. And Polidori's style is a little old-fashioned even for the time. Let me read you a sentence. But first, I'm going to need to take a quick drink. And a very deep breath. <clears throat> at Brussels, and other towns through which they passed, Aubrey was surprised at the apparent eagerness with which his companions sought for the centres of all fashionable vice. There he entered into all the spirit of the faro table. He betted and always gambled with success, except where the known sharper was his antagonist, and then he lost even more than he gained, but it was always with the same unchanging face, 
with which he generally watched the society around. It was not, however, so when he encountered the rash youthful novice, or the luckless father of a numerous family. Then his very wish seemed fortune's law. This apparent abstractedness of mind was laid aside, and his eyes sparkled with more fire than that of the cat whilst dallying with the half-dead mouse. Yes, my friends, that was just one sentence. But in case you get the idea classics are all like that, and it puts you off, let's move on to my second choice from this month. And my second choice for this month is the new annotated Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Now this volume was published in 2005 as part of a set of three by editor Leslie Klinger and it's taken me ages to find this copy and complete my set or at least to find a copy that was a reasonable price. Actually it's a bit heavy so if you don't mind I think I'll put it down. So someone who's read and reread these stories many many times over the years and owns them in various formats, why did I want these editions quite so badly? Well, it's because they're so handsomely presented. The text is in a wonderful double column format. You've got the original story on the inside of the page, the annotations on the outside. And there are also many, many reproductions of the illustrations that appeared when the stories were originally published, both in the Strand magazine and drawn by Sidney Paget, but also in American magazines of the time. Now, I'm not going to comment on the original stories as such, what can I say that hasn't been said by thousands of people over and over again over the past century? But I do want to talk about the annotations a little bit. Now these annotations fall into various categories. For a start you've got the publication history of each story, which is not always as straightforward as you might have thought. And you've also got a definition of Victorian terms that have fallen out of fashion today. Now those were quite intriguing to me, but spoiler warning, they do turn out to be really more mundane than exotic. There's also critical discussion on such vital matters as how many Mrs. Watsons were there, and can you really tell which direction a bicycle is travelling in from its tyre tracks alone? There's also a reference to the staggering amount of Sherlockian scholarship that's been carried out and published over the last hundred years, some of these commentators being extremely perceptive and raising some very good and intriguing points. Others verging on the ridiculous and you can't help feeling mining the character for comedy value and little else. But these are very, very handsome volumes indeed. And as I say, they come in a set of three. I've now read two of them, but I've not read the novels, so that will be turning up in a future review. Now, if you've come here from my cult movie blog, you'll know I'm a huge film fan. And one of my favourite genres is film noir. In fact, I love it so much that I started a project recently to try and watch every film noir made in the English language in the 1940s and 1950s. Now this was an insane idea, for two very good reasons. Firstly, film noir is a style, not a genre based on content. So as a result of that, what is and is not a film noir is really open to debate. So what I did was I took three major sources combine them all to create what I hope was an all-encompassing list, or as far as it could be. So the second reason this is insane was that list turned out to have 882 films on it. <laughs> but I have now seen 866 of them. This is just a quick way to tell you that I love hardball crime fiction. Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, James M. Cain, I've read them all. But one person I never touched was Mickey Spillane. Now the reason I think I didn't was because he has such a poor reputation in literary circles. He was always somebody that critics looked down on, considering his books to be vulgar trash. But about a year or so ago I decided to try one of his Mike Hammer novels and loved it. So I am now in the process of trying to read his entire back catalogue. Now, these are early and mid-1960s paperback editions which combine a couple of novellas that Spillane would have sold to magazines of the time. And this particular one is called Return of the Hood. And it features a title story and another called The Bastard Bannerman. 
and it was published in 1964. Now both these tales follow a very familiar Spillane template. He used it so often it really almost became a formula. We have the anti-hero protagonist, a man with a shady past perhaps linked to organised crime, who returns to the place where he earned his reputation. His reason for doing so, to solve the murder of someone he used to know. But we're not here for intricate, clever plotting or deep character development. What we're here for is two-fisted action, and Spillane delivers. His prose leaps off the page at you, crackling with electricity. The man had a hell of a turn of phrase. Of course, Spillane isn't for everyone. He earned his reputation. And those of a more politically correct nature than myself may find some of his work not to their taste. But personally, I love it, and although this is only minus Spillane, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Obviously, if you love a type of literature as much as I love hardball crime of the 1940s and 50s, you're always on the lookout for new authors, guys who fell through the cracks over the last 50 years. Men like David Goodis, men like Dan J. Marlow, no relation to Philip, of course. Um, those are guys who were very popular in their day in the hardball crime arena, but have been kind of forgotten today. In order to help me in my search for new authors, I purchased this Pocket Essentials Guide to Noir Fiction. And this has been great, because not only does it provide some history and context to the genre, it also name drops many authors who were very popular in their day, and also identifies their most famous titles. And this has obviously set me off on a quest to collect some of those editions and to actually see if I can find some new writers to add to my favourites of the noir genre. And my find this month was Harry Whittington's Fires That Destroy, which was originally published in 1951. This is a very unusual work, especially I would think for its time. OK, it starts in a fairly standard way with a murder. An old rich blind man gets pushed down the stairs by his 20-something secretary. Unfortunately for him, she's discovered the hoard of unregistered cash he keeps around the house and decided to help herself. But from there, the story goes in a completely different direction. By about chapter 4, she's got away with it. She has the money, the police are satisfied, it's been ruled an accident. The main bulk of the tale is what happens to her after that. And there's where we get into an interesting and fairly unusual arena, that of the psychological character study. From then on, Whittington chooses to focus on the motivations of his main protagonist, Bernice. You see, the money wasn't an end in itself for her, but a means to an end. She's always felt undesirable, plain. She's always craved for love that she's been denied, and she thinks that money is going to fix all this. So she throws herself at the first handsome man she sees. And believe me, we realise he's a complete arsehole from the very first line of dialogue that he has. But that doesn't bother her. He's handsome and that's the important thing. Very soon they're married, even though it's plainly obvious what his motivations for agreeing to this are. Unfortunately, he's unable to satisfy her overwhelming sexual desires and her life descends into a misery of hard liquor and self-hatred fueled by the twin demons of her massive inferiority complex and nymphomania. It's a testament to Whittington's undoubted skill as a writer that we retain some sympathy for Bernice. After all, she did push an old blind man down the stairs at the start of the story. And it's a very unusual and thought-provoking novel. Unfortunately, really, after the first few chapters, there's very little plot indeed. And so it kind of came up a little bit short for me. And I don't think that I'll be trying any more of his work. Coincidentally published in the same year as The Fires That Destroy was Herman Wouk's immensely popular The Kane Mutiny. Now, there's never been an official mutiny in the US Navy in all the years of its existence, but there was a real-life incident that came pretty close and inspired Wook to write this Pulitzer Prize winning story. It follows the wartime service of the USS Kane, a minesweeper destroyer that was active in the 1944 Pacific Campaign, and the actions of its captain the unstable Lieutenant Commander Quig, which leads us to him being removed from command during a typhoon.
Our entry to the story is the character of Willie Keith, a youngster mollycoddled from birth by a rich family who is drafted into the service and becomes an ensign on the cane. Although he often seems to be just an observer of events, it's his seemingly minor actions and inactions which act as a catalyst for much more significant outcomes which eventually culminate in the mutiny. Wook actually served on a minesweeper, and that's obvious from the wealth of procedural and background detail he includes, although he's very careful not to let it overwhelm the story. The characters of the senior officers are also incredibly well drawn, so each has a consistent point of view throughout the entire tale, and it is a very lengthy, closely packed narrative. The subsequent court-martial scenes are also extremely gripping. My one bugbear with the novel is that Wu carries on Keith's story after the court-martial. To me, all this does is reinforce points he's already made and character beats he's already very skillfully established, and these later chapters just felt a little redundant to me. The award-winning 1954 movie sensibly ends with the court-martial and showcases wonderful performances from Humphrey Bogart, Jose Ferrer and Fred McMurray. Inevitably, some of the subtleties of such a densely packed novel are lost in the movie, and the character of Willie Keith is pretty much sidelined. But it's still a textbook example of adaptation by screenwriter Stanley Roberts, and a wonderful film. Wook himself adapted the court-martial scenes into a play, which was very successful and is sometimes revived today. Now, one of my pet hates when it comes to artists and artistic endeavour is labelling. Now, we all do it, obviously because we need to be able to navigate our way through the masses of literature, of music and film that's out there to get to the things that we're going to love. But the negative side of that is once someone's labelled, it can put people off checking out their work and missing out. Where I find this particularly relevant is in music. Now, Guy Clark was a singer-songwriter who came out of Texas in the early 1970s, he favoured acoustic arrangements and spoke in a Texas drawl. So inevitably, he got labelled as a country artist. And I can see the red flags getting raised out there already. If it's at all helpful, in later years he was rebranded as one of the godfathers of Americana. But I personally feel he was just an amazing songwriter and a great performer. And this biography, without getting killed or caught, the Life and Music of Guy Clark by Tamara Saviano is both a celebration of that and also a very valuable insight into the character of a very talented man who did not share easily. Clark was not only an amazing songwriter, he was also a painter. He built custom-made guitars in his basement workshop that were in high demand in the industry. And he also acted as a mentor to many younger artists most famous of whom is probably Steve Earle. Fortunately, Saviano worked with Clark in his later years, and this book was begun with Clark's cooperation. If you should want to check out Clark's music, for what it's worth, my favourite albums are Boats to Build from 1992 and Dublin Blues from 1995. This is probably the only biography of Clark that will ever be published. Not because he doesn't merit further retrospectives and volumes, but simply because there's no need. This is definitive. Next up is Donovan's Brain by Kurt C. Odmack, the original Brain in a Tank story, which was published first in 1942. Now, C. Odmack is probably best known these days as screenwriter of Lon Chaney Jr.'s universal classic horror, The Wolfman a film that has been extraordinarily influential over the years. You see, prior to C. O. Mac's script for that movie, werewolf folklore was a disparate collection of medieval legends and tales. He distilled these into the modern werewolf myth as we know it today. In traditional werewolf mythology, the full moon was only one way you could trigger a transformation into the beast. There was also wearing a wolf skin, a special ointment, a magic cloak, a magic belt, a deal with the devil, a family curse, eating wolf meat, drinking rainwater from a wolf's paw print. As well as that, silver was not the only way to kill a werewolf. There were many methods, my particular favourite being rolling him in the grass wet with morning dew. 
what Siobhan did was throw out all these more ridiculous elements and distill what remained into what we know as the modern werewolf myth today. He was also a novelist as well as a screenwriter and Donovan's Brain was his most famous novel. The story features Dr Philip Corey, a scientist stuck in his lab in the middle of nowhere and needing a human brain to carry on his experiments. Right out of the blue he gets a surprising opportunity when a plane carrying disgraced tycoon WH Donovan crashes nearby. Now Corey does try to save Donovan's life but he's unsuccessful and waste not want not he harvests his brain instead, keeps it alive in a tank and tries to learn how to communicate with it. Unfortunately this experiment becomes too successful and he finds Donovan's will taking over his mind and body. Now if this plot is a little on the hokey side what you have to remember is that it was original for the time it was written and C. Mag does litter the text with some very interesting philosophical and scientific speculation. However, for me, this is a classic case of an author writing himself into a corner. Yes, it's a very interesting concept, but what can you really do with it? One of the main antagonists of the tale is a disembodied brain stuck in a tank. How's that going to affect the development of the story and the action? Well, Siodmak elects to make Donovan take over Corey's body and try to make amends for some of his past financial misdeeds. Now, given what we know of Donovan, that does seem somewhat unlikely. And simply it's not really all that gripping. Now this is an interesting novel to be sure, and I'm very glad I read it because I've wanted to for years. But I'm not surprised that none of the three film versions were very successful, which is ironic considering that Siod Mackey is best known as a screenwriter. But adapting this into a movie? Well, it's not a job I would want. Now we're going to finish this month with interviews with B science fiction and horror movie makers by Tom Weaver. Now, if I wasn't watching film noir as a kid, I'd be watching cheap and cheesy science fiction movies from America, especially ones made in the 1950s. Everything from Attack of the 50 Foot Woman to Invasion of the Saucer Men to I Was a Teenage Frankenstein. I loved them then, I love them still. Tom Weaver is a name I know from many a Blu-ray and DVD commentary track and this book is a collection of interviews he carried out for magazines like Starlog and Fangoria over the last couple of decades. Subjects include actors such as Beverly Garland and John Agar, makeup men, special effects technicians, directors and movie moguls too. For a fan like me, it's a fascinating read. And hats off to Mr Weaver for getting these memories down in print from a lot of artists who are sadly no longer with us. I mean, how can you not love a book when some of the interview questions are things like Did you have a better budget and shooting schedule on Attack of the Giant Leeches? Do you remember how you became involved on Superman and the Mole Men? Tell us a little bit about your co-producer on The Curse of the Living Corpse and the Horror of Party Beach. I love this book, I just couldn't put it down, and it's obvious to me that I'll be collecting far more books by Weaver and featuring them in further monthly reviews. Well that was my reading roundup for December 2019, I hope you enjoyed it. Now, I was watching a YouTube tutorial video this morning, and apparently I'm supposed to ask you to push some buttons and things down here? Um, allegedly it's good for my algorithms or something? Which, I'd be grateful if you could, because they've been bothering me a bit recently and I don't like to go to the doctor if I can avoid it. Also, feel free to agree, disagree, pass the time of day in the comments below. So, that was my first YouTube video. I got through it eventually. <laughs> um, I guess someday we'll look back at this and laugh, won't we? Probably. Anyway, see you next time and please, don't be a stranger. Now if this plot sounds a little on the hokey side, what you have to remember it was... Subjects are actors like Beverly Garland and John Agar, as well as movie moguls, mocha... The mocha men? Or would if I bloody blind it?
If you want to check out Clark's music at all, for what it's worth, my favourite of his records, a boots, boots to build? <laughs> Maybe not. <clears throat> Unfortunately for him, she's discovered this cache of hidden... cache of hidden cash. Now these are early and mid-1960s paperback editions, which typically combine a couple of novellas that spill out Got it right and I stopped. <coughs> Twat. <clears throat> Polidori was actually a doctor by profession, not a writer. And he was the personal provi physician. Profession. <clears throat> you see, before... You see, prior to C.O. Mac's script for that movie, Well, bloody hell is it? Why, not? Why didn't I make a note of the bloody page? That would have been helpful, wouldn't it? And this biography by Tamara Saviano, without getting killed or caught, the life and music of Roy Clark. Roy Clark? There's also reference to the staggering amount of Sherlockian scholarship which has been carried out over the last thousand years. Thousand years? <laughs> that would be a staggering amount, wouldn't it? <laughs> So, typically, paperbacks like Return of the Hood here feature two stories. The title story and the other one, which name I can't remember. <laughs> I hope I got a break in there so I can't edit that. <laughs> I don't fancy doing that on spiel again. <clears throat>